All right. Uh, so I can start now, right? Yes. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Grandmaster Alexander Lenderman. And who can recall us? Um, what was the main theme in uh, last week's uh, My Greatest Losses uh, theme? You know, what was the main uh, pattern in common in the last time? Uh, yeah? Well, yeah, you got you, you you got it. Yeah, you got the main point. But anyone wants to add to that? Well, I didn't hear what he was saying. Well, it, well, we basically what he was saying that you gotta develop. Yeah. Um, That's what I re remember. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you have to make sure that you don't fall behind in development. And okay, sometimes it's trickier than than other times, but it's still important to stick to the basics. Okay. Well, today um, we're gonna you know go over games where I lost because of uh, either having bad pieces, uh, making some of my pieces bad, or not uh, restricting my opponent's pieces, or in other words, having my opponent's pieces too much fun. Um, so also a different kind of sense of danger, but more like a strategical kind instead of like more of a dynamic one. All right, so we're gonna start off with the loss that I had against the international master Craig Hilby. And this game was a pretty bad game, bad, badly played game by me. But, you know, it's a game we can definitely learn from. So I was white. And my opponent, you know, he needed the uh, 3 out of 3 to get his norm. So he was trying to play for a win and trying to play uh, an unbalanced game. So he played uh, e6. He played a system with e6, g6. So I didn't know the line. I unfortunately I didn't really check this before the game, and uh, I decided to play it very safe with g3. Uh, but the more principled is the line with h4. Uh, in general, whenever the knight is going to e7, and the pawns on g6, h4, h5 makes a lot of sense. And depending on what black does, let's say h5, now e4 could be pretty good, because after this takes takes. Bishops coming to g5 and uh, applying some pressure on that knight, uh, forcing some more weaknesses. Didn't black play h6 though? You mean here? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you know, you can also do that. But then I can go bishop f4, queen d2, and now the pawn on h6 becomes a problem. So, yes, h6 is definitely a typical idea to meet h4 with h6, but basically, whatever black tries to do, um, he's gonna have to make some concessions. So I think white is better. But I played this, castles, bishop g2, d5. So now, at least in this case, he's able to kind of shut down my bishop like that. And here, for some reason, I just, you know, had a brain cramp. I took on d5, which is, of course, completely unnecessary. It would have been much better to just castle here. Uh, because when I took on d5, I helped this bishop become a better piece. Um, and in this position, um, I guess I was afraid of this a little bit, but then of course I just go here. Knight f5, rook d1, and there's... He can't ever really take on d4, and uh, I will get the pawn back and will be comfortable. So, and of course later I played more like this in another game. It was a little bit different move order there, but... I had something with c4, g3 already played, and uh, so it's still useful to know this position, but of course I didn't take on d5. But in this game, in this game I took on d5, he took ed, I castled, he played knight c6, which, okay, he can also play c6, but he's trying to apply some pressure on this. It's also a system here. Uh, so I played b3, knight f5, e3, knight c7, and now I played b4, and this move is actually very controversial. Uh, the reason it's controversial is, well, on one hand, I'm trying to potentially prepare a minority attack in case black plays c6 or something, defending this pawn. But on the other hand, very more importantly, I'm giving up control over the c4 square in the long run, and that thing is very, very dangerous. 
So it's uh, a move is you know very risky, but I kind of knew it was risky. So, but I still shouldn't have played it. So bishop b two would have been better. Bishop b two, bishop a three, just play kind of a neutral move. Although at this point I'm not already better. It's just position. But it was one of these I was trying to create. Well, given that you look at this now, which would you do? B two or a three? Um, probably b2 but i mean i can't say i looked i studied this game that deeply to know the differences and even if i do it's not a position that the computer will understand that well the differences it's like very very subtle i mean even for a world champion you know such a difference is hard but intuitively i would say more likely b2 but these are not the kind of decisions which usually impact the game because it's like bishop b2 or bishop a3 the difference is very small i mean even if it turns out you put it to the wrong square, you can always go back. The thing is with the pawn push, you can't take it back. That's why it's a more resp uh, more kind of responsible kind of move. And references Sam Shanklin's book on pawn, uh, pawn play. So black played a6 here. I played a4 and he played c6. Now I played rook a3 because I'm preparing to play b5. And he cannot play b5 because I take, take, take. So knight d6, b5. Okay, I'm, I'm giving up the pawn, but of course I will get it back in many different ways. Pawn on b5 will be very weak. So my opponent played knight c4. Now here I missed an, you know, an interesting decision, which would have at least guaranteed me to get a, maybe not a better position, but like, uh, also like much more comfortable game that I got in the game uh, so who can come up with an interesting decision for white here in this position Addy sorry so sacking the exchange? Um, that's interesting, but I don't know if we need to... Okay, so queen b3, I'll take, 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 take. Yeah, I mean, this could be, could be interesting, but here I think I'll, I'll be at least okay, because I, you know, here you're giving up the exchange for, for just without even getting a pawn for it. You're just giving up the exchange. So actually your idea, the concept was good, but the execution uh, could have been better. So what you should do is you should take on c6 and now Black has a choice if he takes here then I can go rook b3 and I still create a little bit of a weakness But more importantly, I do not open up that file the a file does not get opened up and that's like a huge plus for me compared to the game If he takes with the knight, okay, that's you know, the, also nothing opens up So the critical is this but this is actually a little inaccurate because then I take and this is just like a, you know, this is what Addy wanted, but now we get an extra pawn out of this. And now d5 also becomes weak. And the bishop on g7 is biting on granite, pawn on d4, staring at it. So then I can play queen b3, knight e1, knight d3, as my arrows dictate. I have control over the c5 square. All of my pieces are potentially very good, and I have a good chance of getting a second pawn, so I'm definitely not worse here. So that would have been a very nice decision to take on c6. Instead, I played rook b3. I, I guess I just, you know, underestimated the danger of this moment. I thought this no harm, no foul. But now he gets a little something. He gets an open file as well. And now he plays a good move. He plays knight f5, knight d6 to secure that knight on a good square before developing the bishop. Like this move would have been inaccurate because then this knight is unhappy. So first he secures that knight, and then he worries about where the bishop belongs. Takes, takes. And now at least here I should have sensed the danger that, man, I mean, I'm, I'm very passive and my opponent's pieces are very active. And if I just play a couple of small, slow moves, I can really get into trouble. So this was the opportunity to play e4, maybe, and unbalance the game slightly. And it was double-edged, but it was still better than what I did in the game. And in the game, I played queen c2. 
uh, he played knight d6, I played rook d1. I wanted to get the rook in the game somehow. And I thought, okay, I'll give him a tempo, but I didn't really see what's the big problem here. And I thought here I didn't really sense how you know bad my position already is. But the rule is any kind of passive position has potential to be a loss. You know, that's like the general rule of thumb. So queen c7 was played. And now knight h4. And here I was already sensing that I'm definitely not better, maybe a little bit worse. So even though I'm playing a lower rated, at this point I was happy to repeat moves and make a draw. But my opponent, to his credit, played, played the game on, which, you know, it gives, gives him a lot of respect. Because, you know, it's not like he's totally winning or anything like that, or like, it's not like he's like easily, clearly better. But, despite the fact that he's playing somebody almost 200 points higher with black, he's still, you know, playing on the position. And that was, you know, very impressive in my opinion. And it's not like I even offered the draw, it's like I repeated moves, so, you know, it's, it would have been very tempting to just say, okay, let's make a draw. But, you know, that was, you know, that just goes to show how he was really ready to play this game. Okay, so takes, queen takes, so now he has control over both B and A file. And uh, again, I'm still kind of suffering to find counterplay. So I played this, he went here, well, the idea is if he goes here right away, then rook b1. So, so that's why he played here first, securing the bishop. So rook c1, queen b2. Was the knight to h4 not a chance here? Knight h4, I think bishop c2. And now maybe queen b2, something like that. If he gets it anyway. Yeah. So that's why he now put the bishop back to f5. So rook c1, queen b2. Now we can see how he's really getting control over the position. So here he's playing it patiently. He sees he does not have knock knockout blow. So he just played h6 using the fact that actually I don't have a, a useful move. Like, I mean, I'm, for me, it's very hard to find a move. So he finds a move that is useful in every case and lets me figure out what move I should play. Very good, mature move. So I played knight d1, but that probably makes my position a bit worse. Queen a3. Now I can't go here because of this. So knight h4, bishop e6, knight c3. And now he pushes my knight away. And you know, that's where the h6 move became very useful because now he just simply goes back with the bishop you know, pawn on g5, you know, now there's never any kind of counterplay with knight h5, knight h4, and certainly the move is uh, very safe because there's no way white can open up the game or attack the king, so g5 is totally not a weakness, it's just like restricting my knight. So I played knight e2, knight e4, but now this knight comes here, bishop b4, queen b3, what else? And you, you can't just take it. Okay. Take what? There. Queen protects everything. Yeah. Oh, okay. So bishop b4, queen b3, bishop c3, rook a2. Okay, so now he's threatening rook takes e2 as well, and then knight takes c3. So bishop f1, and bishop g4. Yeah, that attacks my knight now. Rook b1, queen a4, and now I played uh, king g2. So um, here black has lots of um, promising ideas. Question is, which is like the most knockout one? Uh, here I was still hoping for like a chance for a bailout, but c5 i don't know i think i control that d4 square pretty well anyway so i'm not sure if it has really any bite that move because even if c5 you're not really threatening anything even if you take i take with the bishop or i have too many pieces on that square so it will probably not be well i was thinking uh, if you go to b c5 and you take it then the bishop 
your vision fund, gee. Yes, but I don't have to take anything. That's no. the point. That's the point. Well, I was thinking that his C6 pawn is actually kind of weak. If you, if you can survive the middle game, that would be a weakness. That was not what I'm thinking. Um, yeah, well, that's true, but I mean, you know, here you have such a dominating position and you're really having such active pieces that a potential attack on the king that you don't really want to preoccupy yourself with how weak the c6 point is. I mean, in this position, they're like things way more important. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's something that actually I was hoping he would do and then take the rook, right? Yeah, that's something I was hoping for, because at least here, I mean, I'm probably lost, but at least I have control over some light squares. And even the end game, I was thinking maybe it's a little chance, knight comes to f5, maybe a little bit of a chance of a fortress. Not very realistic, but I thought, okay, at least here I can still gravel on for some moves. So at this point, you know, that was, you know, my hope. But my opponent, you know, unfortunately for me, found a much, you know, more authoritative way to play. He saw that bishop takes f3 is something I can't really stop anyway. So he just played queen c2. He's playing for a mating attack. Because now he, th well, I'll show you shortly what he threatens. So for example, let's say I go here, here and bishop b4. So what would black do in this position then? Take the knight, king takes. Yeah, bishop takes. And then the other knight. Queen e4 mate. Yeah. Although, the, oh, although of course this is also winning, but you know this is mate and one. <laughs> yeah. So the point is, you know, black is um, having this huge threat, and I cannot stop it. So I tried to play knight fg1, but this is of course, you know, very much a disaster takes 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 then he's coming in here so he won the pawn but the attack continues that's the problem and now he just took and he just come came in here and the rest is easy pickings and you know that's how the game ended with a mate like this so this was a game where again i allowed that knight on c4 i allowed my opponent's Rook to be on the A-file, I just allowed my opponent to be too comfortable. I allowed too much peace activity to my opponent. And that was the main reason why I lost the game. And even the lower rated, as a result, was able to play a very strong game like that. Alright, so now I'll show you a game that I lost to Hammer Jan Ludwig here in St. Louis in, the, in one of these uh, fall classics. Hammer Jan Ludwig is a pretty strong GM. Uh, 26.50 or something like that. 26.62 at this tournament. So the opening was relatively slow. Nothing that much was happening. You know, both sides are playing relatively logically. Logic of moving the queen to c8. Yeah. Um, I wanted to take on c4 or go d4. Queen d7. Uh, I was. No, no, just, just leaving where it is. No, but if takes bishop takes b7. Yeah. So I, I wanted to prepare, you know, oh, moving. I see what you're doing. Okay. Yeah, so queen b8. Again, this is this part is not like so relevant. I mean, for for the main theme, it's it was just like he, yeah, yeah. Here here it was more like yeah, true. Uh, yeah, here but here it was more like I mean, okay, the the opening was interesting, but I wanted to just get to the main theme of the game. Um, that's why I went through it a little bit. Yeah, so this was an, an interesting moment right here. So here. If I wanted to play it safe, I could, of course, just trade queens and play rook c8, and I don't think I ever lose this position. 
I just bring the king in the game and we probably shake hands here. But I was a little bit ambitious here. I thought I'm a little bit better because I have pawn on c5, he has a pawn on d3. And I played this move, but this move I think wasn't very good. I think I should play queen e7 with the idea being I'm trying to stop his uh, play. My goal is I have this space advantage, so I need to protect that space. And then I just need to go g6, king g7, and maybe start a little bit of an initiative on the king's side. And if I wanted to play for a win, that was probably the way to, to go. Instead, I played like this, rook c2, and I went for something very concrete. But it's a, always a very risky dilemma. You know, whenever we're going for a concrete play, but it's anti-positional, and this is again like one of these anti-positional moves where we're giving up our space, we're hoping that something will work, work out concretely. But if it doesn't, then you know we lose our positional trumps. So it was a move that was risky and it did not pay off. You know, it's a move I should not have played. He took, I took, and he played queen f3, just defending everything. I played rook c8, no, I played h6 first. Uh, King g2, and now I ended up going queen b4, so already I'm kind of uh, realizing that my queen on c4 doesn't have any bite, so I'm trying to reposition my pieces. But now my opponent is having a little bit of an initiative, and here it was a little bit annoying. I felt like, yeah, I gave my opponent some play, which he never should have had. So bishop e5, rook c1, rook b8. I don't remember why I did that, I maybe just... Uh, Getting the rook out of potential attacks. B3. Are you thinking at this point that the bishop is weaker than the knight? Um, well, I think the main problem is not so much that. It's more like he has control over the open file. The c file. It's, I think, probably the more annoying part. So b3. Queen a5. g4. So again, he's looking for a way to create some problems. He sees a hook I have pawn on h6. So he's looking for a way to create some initiative. In the meantime, he's going for this, f6, rook d2. I have to go here. I cannot go here, my ideal square, because then he takes, 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 and takes. So um, queen a5, rook c2. Rook takes d2, knight takes d2, rook d8, knight c4, queen c5, queen e4, and here I ended up playing queen d5. Um, I really wanted to play rook d4 here, but there is a reason I didn't do that. Who can tell us? I mean, this is a little bit of a tactical exercise for you. Uh, who can tell us why was rook d4 not good, even though maybe tempting, potentially? Queen a8 check, king h7. And now a strong move knight e3. And he just coming in here. I still thought maybe rook takes g4 I could make it work, but unfortunately after king h3, it's just not working and it was very frustrating. Rook here, takes, takes, queen f3 and I just have a bad end game. And I was very annoyed after I lost the game when my opponent told me that he would have gone queen g6. And he had one minute on the clock, so he might have done that. But then I saw that I'm actually okay. Queen d5, f3, bishop c7. And that was, uh, you know, and here I'm okay. Knight e3, queen a5, and so on. So that was, you know, a little bit unlucky here. But I guess luck for all of us, you know, because we can learn some new things from the way the endgame played out. So queen d5, queen takes, 
Rook takes. It looks safe, but I knew it's a little bit unpleasant because I thought that he still has that pressure along that C file. So I went back, knight d2, bishop d8, knight f3, king f7, rook c8. And now, question is, okay, what would you do as, as black in this position? To win or to not lose? Well, you know, it depends on how you evaluate the position. Right. So first you have to evaluate what you think the position is, you know, whether you're slightly worse or you're slightly better or it's equal, you know, and then, you know, based on that, you know, try to make a decision. But yeah. Rook d7, and then if, let's say, I play knight c4, knight d4. Bishop where? Oh, pawn a6. Um, yeah, but here I think I, you know, we're suffering a bit, right? Rook c6 maybe, you know, forcing e5 at some point. Here, oh, sorry, my, my bad. Um, yeah, here I think, yeah, this is a little bit unpleasant. I can, you know, play a move like h5, I can play rook c6. Here I think it's not quite equal, we're suffering here. Um, so we don't really want to go into this defensive crouch. So the best move was to realize that my bishop on d8 became from like a very good piece early on, so now it's like a struggling piece. So what I needed to do is I needed to get it in the game, play f5, and uh, try to create counterplay with some bishop f6. And then, you know, I think I'm doing perfectly fine. Because after this, it's a prophylactic against this, by the way, because bishop takes h4. And after h5, I think you can play f4 and stuff. Rook, no, not, the, not f4. Maybe a5 first, and then at some point you're looking at f4 and bishop f6. And, you know, we have, we have counterplay here. Black isn't really all that much worse. Maybe not worse at all. Well, any move would have, almost any move would have been better than the move I played in the game. And the move that I played in the game is very, once again, based on concrete play, but it's very bad positional. I played the move e5. And now we have a big problem. So you see we have a dark square bishop. And in this position I have literally all of my pawns on dark squares. And I ended up putting that la one last pawn that was still had potential to be on a good square. I put it also on a dark square. That means I'm completely bankrupt on the light squares. Completely bankrupt. I gave them all out to that knight. And now my opponent can totally create a light square domination. Starting with uh, which move? Yeah? H5. Very good, h5. Because we need to activate that knight to get it to f5 or maybe g6. Dominate the light squares. By the way, e4 would have been bad because then after rook d3, we're giving up a lot of dark squares. Potentially with b5, bishop b6, and we're creating new weaknesses. So h5. Of course, if he didn't have h5, may maybe e5 would have been acceptable. But because he has h5, it's like I, it's, it was a prophylactic against knight d4, but it was one of these that cure was worse than the, disease, than the disease. Because the knight anyway is able to access the, into my territory. The knight anyway is able to get into my game. So I'm not really stopping the idea. I might have stopped like a certain move, but I didn't stop the main idea for him to activate the knight. And now I've only weakened, you know, new squares. So I played here, knight h4, bishop e7. Okay, now you're white. How would you try to uh, uh, continue your uh, technique here? How would you try to convert this? Pause, that's possible. She sh uh, what do you think? Um, 
Okay, any other ideas? Mm, e4, I never like that move because uh, bishop c5, rook d2, you're giving me counterplay in the dark squares. You're giving my bishop much more life, which we don't want to do. We want to restrict that bishop. Keep it restricted. Well, let me ask you this question logically. So, we don't know yet whether we want the knight on f5 or on g6. It's like both are possible. But what move in this position is a move that we need to play anyway to improve our position in the end game? Yeah? Yeah, so that's why he played king f3 without too much thinking. Why? Because king f3 we need to play anyway. We don't declare our intentions. It's a flexible move. You know, now, in some cases, we might go knight f5, some cases knight g6, but we don't need to show our hand yet here. So bishop b4, king e4, rook d2, rook c7, king g8, and now king comes in. You know, and now you see how bankrupt I am on the light squares. You see what was the consequence of putting all my pawns in the dark squares. It made my bishop kind of an empty piece without too much purpose. And in the meantime, I'm just losing on the light square because he has three pieces attacking me now, which I cannot really stop. I tried rook takes f2. Now, what's the most precise move here? King g6 or king e6? Yeah? King g6 yeah. Very good, because after this, there's bishop f8, for example, and after this, rook g2, and suddenly, black is counterplay. So you have to be very careful and concretely with concrete play, even in a winning technical position. But king e6 kind of seals my fate, because now there's just knight g6, knight g6 rook c8, and I cannot stop the mating net. So I tried f5. Now it's still not too late to go wrong with knight g6, allowing this and this, and black is winning suddenly so of course there's you know we have to be patient just take on just go check bishop f8 and take that rook d2 but there's no mate of course and here i resigned because i'm gonna be ended up in a king and pawn endgame which is totally lost and uh, that was the game so in this game it was a problem of you know having a bad bishop restricting my own bishop just uh you know, losing because of, you know, a bad piece and making my opponent's pieces stronger. So once again, lack of attention to piece activity in this game. But earlier when the bishop and the knight were in the middle, when I asked you the question, which was better, at that point the bishop was okay? At that point, yes. Okay. It's just, uh, I, uh, well, I, I, I kind of played too many pawn moves on the dark squares, h6 and stuff, but especially, you know, in, in, in the end, that e5 kind of sealed my fate. If I don't play five, it's still fine. I think at that point, they were probably roughly equal pieces. Maybe the knight was still potentially a little bit better, but not by that much. Okay. Uh, but yeah, yeah it, was, um, it was an unpleasant one for me. And it was at a time when I was doing well at the tournament, three and a half out of five, and you know that was my first loss in that tournament. And then I lost one right after that, as oftentimes happens. All right, now we're gonna take a look at my loss to Richard Rapport. And I'm again playing with the black pieces. So my opponent played an interesting system. Bishop d3 with the idea of bishop c2, d4. Very, well, it's not very common against the, it's more common when the pawn's on d6. Not so much when the pawn's on e6. Because here I could just play for d5, but I played here. Uh, so he castled. I played d5. And now he played e5. Knight d7. Alright, what do you guys think white should do in this position? Yeah? Rook e1. Rook e1 is like the most tempting move. It's the first move that comes to mind. But now, this move would have actually gotten white amazingly this early in the game he could have gotten into lots of trouble because of an innocent looking move because black has a very strong move in this position. So who can, who can try to find that move? It's a very instructive. Queen c7. Queen c7 is not gonna you know, be so dangerous because then I can play bishop b5 anyway or I can go queen e2, 
So queen c7 is okay, but it's not gonna be, you know, anything that's, yeah. C4, queen, c7, same thing. Oh, queen, b6? Yeah, but still, I'll play d4. Okay. Why is this so, so scary? Okay, rook, e2. A bit b4 next, maybe. I mean, okay, black has a fine position, but so does white. Just normal position. Yeah, we're looking for a way to really get a, an advantage here after rook, e1. Yes? It's too slow still. A6, B5, okay, I'll just go here and D4. I mean, that's uh, not gonna be anything, yeah? D4, also nothing that special. I'll develop, Knight A3, let's say, and then try to challenge the pawn on D4. Again, it's a normal, all of these are moves are normal, but there's an idea that's very powerful here as, as black. Very unconventional, like somehow people miss it, but it's it's a very good idea to to know about. It turns out this knight on f3 is really short on squares, and we're also kind of targeting this pawn in many different ways. But we can play this move, yeah? Yes, very good, yeah, g5. Because now we're threatening g4, and g4 wins a piece. So white has no time for bishop b5 or anything like that. So if you can, you know, even if we can, let's say, attack the knight, you know, well, let's say here, even if white plays something like this, now it's suddenly a position where it's black's the one who is attacking. For example, now you can play your c4 idea, you know, queen c2, bishop knight c5, and we can see that now we have an h file open, and we can always even castle a queen side if we really need to. So the attack is very much in our favor. The g5 idea is actually very common even in the French positions, you know, in these closed variations. Whenever the center is closed, you know, whenever the center is closed like that, and potentially white has this kind of structure, or maybe white hasn't had time to get the structure, this g5 is a very typical idea actually in these positions and something you have to always be on the lookout. The queen side is asleep. Yeah, that's why such a move works. That's why my opponent played a correct move. He played bishop b5. Uh, so that was a good move. Uh, I played uh, a6. That move maybe wasn't the strongest, but it was still kind of okay. Takes, takes. And now, what do you think white should do in this position? d4 would be a positional mistake, because then after this, we have, now we're making this other pawn relevant. We're going to be able to play c5, bishop e7, and we're going to start chipping away on this pawn as well. And we can undouble the pawns. We open up the game as black. We have two bishops. We're very happy. So we want to make sure in this kind of structure, we keep this bishop on c8 kind of restricted. C4. So the best move is d3 followed by c4. I mean, maybe c4 right away also makes some sense, but I think d3 is, you know, pretty logical, but just not with not d4. So bishop e7. Here I had an interesting idea of going h6, g5, and then bishop g7, but I didn't really think about that. I played here. Now next few moves, yeah, he plays c4. So now I realized he wants to go knight c3, knight a4. So I realized I had to do something, so I played f6. I decided to strike while he's not completely developed yet, which was a good move. Takes, takes, and of course I saw that this pawn is not really uh, a very good pawn to take because after I take, take, what does black do here? Best move. Yep. Knight with knight no, you can even you can even just take this because there's like mates all over the place. Takes, 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 and mate. Again, pieces are asleep, so I knew that, so that's why I knew he cannot take on e6. I calculated that. I mean, intuitively, I felt he cannot take, and then my calculation was there to verify that. So knight c3, knight b6, and uh, here he played the uh, move knight a4. So the idea is he wants to trade the knights, and after I uh, took, 
If I take here, he would take here and then take here. And that's okay for white? Yeah. Yeah, because black still has some weaknesses. So he played uh, takes, takes, and I played queen d6. And now he decided to undouble his, my pawns, but with a concrete idea in mind, he wants to go bishop f4 and um, create some initiative. Uh, you know, chase my queen around and also fight for the square, which makes a lot of sense. Queen b6. And now he played rook e2, so, you know, uh, kind of indirectly defending the pawn on b2. I mean, I can take it still, but then I thought, here maybe I'm slightly worse. But maybe it's okay for me. Like some bishop d7 or bishop takes c5, it was complicated. I didn't want to go into that, I played uh, bishop e7. He played bishop e5. And this is a this I think is a critical moment of the game, which I I kind of uh, probably I don't I don't think I realized this was critical move. So it's black to play, and uh, how would you play in this position? Yes. Very good. Very good, Ashish, you got it right away. d4, bishop b7, and then bishop d5. That way, this side, this move does two things. Number one, it shuts the queen down from going to g4 and fair from playing for initiative. And number two, I'm, I'm saving the square for my bishop. Bishop goes to d5. And yes, I'm potentially giving up c4 square, but again, you have to give something to get something sometimes in chess. And even though he can do that, but I'm winning the pawn here, I mean, yes, he might get some compensation, but it's nothing so scary. And otherwise, I'm going bishop b7, bishop d5, and here I would have felt very good. Here I would not be worse. Maybe a little bit worse, but nothing too scary. Instead of that, I played a bad move, queen b5. And of course, he will never trade with me, because the end game is going to be only fine for me uh, in this position. By the way, it's worth noting that a move like bishop d6 is not very good either because there has two weaknesses. Number one is that we still have the e5 square control with the knight. Right now we have a dilemma where both pieces want the e5 square. It's like two kids fighting for the same toy. Pieces are redundant. But after this, you know, now knight comes to e5 and also this pawn becomes weak. You know, we remove the main protector. And also whenever we have a bad piece, like a bishop on c8 or something, we usually don't want to trade down the other pieces because then we're kind of stuck with that bad one. So that's why it's important to keep this one. And d4 would have, you know, been a very good move. And, I, and moving b, b, uh, bishop to b7 first would... Queen g4. Over. Okay. Yeah. yeah. D, d5 or d4 wouldn't be Mate. Oh, well, yeah. uh, so, I mean, okay, rook f7 you can play, but you already allowed the queen in, you know, that's, yeah. you know. So, queen b5, queen g4, and we saw how much problems later that queen uh, created for me. So, once again, it was a situation where I didn't make the most of my pieces, and I allowed my opponent's pieces too much momentum. Rook f7, rook d1, okay, he needs to defend the d3 pawn. Bishop f8, queen h3, setting up knight g5. Bishop back, queen g3. And now I played d4, but a little bit too late. And now he played h4. And I played a move that was probably not very good. I played h6, creating some new weaknesses, in particular the g6 square. I mean, I was trying to stop knight g5, but it was probably at this point better to just allow it. Uh, because now he found a very nice maneuver, after which he has a much better position. Knight h2, exclamation part. He's simply preparing the idea of going queen g6, followed by knight g4. And I don't really have a good antidote against this idea. It's very powerful play. King h7, for example, h5. So it's a very tough position for me already, probably lost. Uh, evaluation is around plus two here, because his, position, his pieces are just flooding in. 
So I played h5, he played here. I played c4, trying to go for desperate counterplay. He took, I took, he went here. Queen d5, and knight f3. Okay, so cannot take that, obviously still mate. Bishop b7, rook takes d4. Queen takes a2, rook c7, queen a1, king h2, bishop takes f3. All right, and now white to play, find the find the finishing finishing touches of this beautiful game by my opponent. Yes. Rook f4, very good. Good start. Rook f8. You want to continue? Bishop d4? Or was it 6? I'm sorry. Bishop d6? Um, yeah, but I think then I can. Then you're losing control over. This is a little bit complicated, I think. Oh, also, I'm, aren't you like pinned here? You know, the Baruch is pinned, I think. Yeah, it's a little, uh, bishop d6, you know, you, you don't really want to move the bishop away from e5, ideally. It's too good of a piece. You want to try to look for moves. Bishop d6 is just too complicated. We want to look for moves that, yeah? Rook e7, if I take. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I'm. I don't think. I'm not sure if you're mating me though, and you're down a rook. Okay. Yeah, this is not mate. And okay, I mean you might still have some initiative, but it's not really the clean cut solution. Yeah. Okay. Takes. Here I'm also defending. So sometimes when we see a certain tactical idea but it doesn't work with one mover, we have to look for sometimes switching the move order. That's a typical thing with yeah. Take the bishop first. Oh, or rook f3. Yeah, I mean rook f3 is certainly you know the the safest one and um, it certainly is winning, but. I think, you know, I can play a queen e1 or something. Okay, the game continues a little bit. I mean, there is a way to just, it's like forced mate here. But you have to just, you know, find a move that's... Queen times e3, uh, e6. Queen it takes... The rook and then you can start doing uh, I don't know. I'll play with bishop g4 maybe. It's also not so clear, I think. Again, you know, the queen on g6 is doing very well. Well, we're trying to set up, you know, so that queen takes f7 or rook takes f7 will lead to mate. But if we start with this and then we go rook c8, then you would give him bishop f8. So just try to find us the different, yeah? Um, rook c8. Yes, rook c8. And this is game over because, uh, again, I'm still tied down and now he's just threatening queen takes f7 with mate on g7. And I cannot take any of the rooks because of take here, here, and if take here, here. So I had nothing better than to play rook f6, to try to, but it only prolongs the agony. He took with the rook, I took here, he took here, and I let him mate me. Mm -hmm. Same kind of mate as against Craig Hilby, by the way, on the same square, just from the other side. So it's, uh, again, it's very instructive, you know, when it's, whenever you're attacking and you see you have a tactical idea that doesn't quite work, try to look at it from a different move order. Sometimes that can help you solve the problem. That's like a very important tactical motive. And on, another thing to keep in mind is 
whenever you see a certain tactical idea, um, you know, it's, 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 whenever you see a certain tactical idea, and let's say on, move, on this move it doesn't work, it still means you have to keep an, keep an eye on that idea later, because later on something might change and that idea might, might work. All right, so let's uh, see one more game. And this game is a game against uh, Emilio Cordova, another strong GM. And I'm again black, and this was like a pivotal game in the, in the Pan American Continental Championship, which thankfully I still was able to get into the World Cup from that, despite this loss. But um, at that moment, it was a very unpleasant loss. You played him? Yeah. Where? Oh, nice. Yeah, I mean, he's currently studying at Webster, by the way. Cordova. Okay, so we're gonna not spend too much time in the opening since we don't have tons of time anymore. He played an interesting idea with a3, fighting for initiative. a3, b4. I played here and he played b4. Uh, here I have several ways to play, but uh, since I didn't know the line, I decided to play it safe and play d6. I could have went for this line, but somehow I didn't really consider that. I only considered taking with a pawn, after which I thought um, this is the kind of game I didn't want to play. I didn't want to give him any initiative, because I know he's good with the initiative. So I played here, and now we're just developing pretty routinely. Certainly both play for both sides could be maybe improved a little bit, but uh, again, for the grand scheme of things, it's not such a big deal. Okay, so here is the first interesting moment of the game where um, I feel like I made a practical mistake. And uh, also, first of all, question to you guys is what would you play as black here and then another question would be uh, then I'll explain to you how I should have thought about this position and how I you know did not think correctly about this position okay so what do you think okay yes yeah rook d6 is certainly possible but okay, then the game continues, like 95 and everything, you know, it's normal game. So as you might guess, since I stopped you guys, you know, there is something concrete here, yeah? Okay, I'm, I'm looking at the two of knights and I don't like where they are. So I'm thinking bishop to, C, uh, to uh, a4, mm -hmm. attacking the rook, and then that allows the knight to b3, and mm -hmm. the knight can come back to b4. Very good, yeah, so that's, no, your idea is, you know, making a lot of sense, and of course, I consider this move. So, he, I knew he has to go here, and then I can play knight b3. Yeah. So, I saw that, but the reason I rejected that, and I thought about this for 20 minutes, is because I thought he goes here. And the problem is, then I cannot go knight d4 anymore, because he takes, and after this, he takes back with the knight. Two pieces for rooks, so that's not working. So then I thought about, okay, rook takes d3. But then I thought position is very unclear. He can play knight c3. I think I, th I, think I saw rook c3. And I was just like, I thought my pieces are getting tangled up. And I just couldn't really work it out. It was very complicated, but I couldn't really work it out. So, but the mistake I made from a practical standpoint of view was that I should not have tried to calculate it all out. Instead, I should have looked here and seen, do I have any alternatives to rook takes d3? And it turns out, I actually had to move knight back to a5 here. Because now, a white has a tough choice. He has to either go back and make a draw, or he has to go here. But now, this is very unadvisable for him, because now he his rook is misplaced on c3, and now I can play queen e7, knight c6, rook d7, and uh, it's like, yeah, he's a his pieces are awkwardly placed. His harmony is spoiled. Uh, but maybe, so I, I should have known at the very minimum I will have this. So like the cost, the risk is not very high. Even if it turns out the bishop a4 doesn't work out. Even if it turns out 
that here rook takes d3 doesn't work, I'm not risking anything here. So that should not have been the reason for declining to play bishop a4. Because you, you, you all know that it's much easier to see two moves ahead than four moves ahead. Right? So the point is, I should have done these moves. And then here is where I should have been thinking. Here is where I should have tried to calculate rook takes d3 where it worked. Plus there, would have been a, there was a chance he might have just gone here. After which I, I, now again I have a pleasant choice. I can go knight a5 or I can go knight d4 winning the exchange for very minimal compensation. Well, okay, not winning the exchange, I mean, but, I mean, he probably would have done this and played for some compensation instead of, um, instead of going here, which just loses a pawn for nothing. So the point, long story short, he was, uh, he was, uh, he would have had to make a tough choice. Does he go rook d1 and allow sort these sorts of problems? Or does he go rook c2, which allows a different set of problems, right? He would have had to make a decision. And while he's thinking, then I can figure out, do I play knight a5 and go the safe route? Or, well, here it would have been, would have been much easier to figure out this move. And then even after this, I have lots of moves. Even the move like queen takes e4. And for example, knight e5 takes, takes, and takes, you know. I think, uh, I think there was, or maybe it's... Uh, no, here I just take, sorry, by my mistake. I think it might have been after knight e1 that I do this, this, and this. So the point, and after queen b2, then knight d4, based on this idea. So the point is the tactics do work out for me. But, you know, again, it's hard to see in advance, but the more important thing is that I have a bailout option, just going knight a5. This is why I should have went for this, even if I couldn't see all the way through till the end in the other line. Does that make sense to everyone? That's like the practical value of the calculation. I shouldn't expect to see everything in advance, especially when I have a bailout option. Instead, I didn't do that. I was a mistake in calculation, in, in judgment. I played here. And now he started some initiative on the king's side. I should have, by the way, played bishop b7. Like bishop a8 was a little bit too, too much. And uh, now he starts, um, he starts his initiative. And the question for you guys is this. What would you play in West Black in this position? And this was, you know, the critical moment. Okay, sure, go ahead. No, I'm just pushing, I'm just going E5. E5 is an interesting move, but problem is we're, I think, giving up the D5 square is a bit too much because uh, now our rooks become irrelevant and now white's getting too much play. And that's the same problem with G5, by the way. Because right. G5, there's anyway knight D5. Otherwise, G5 would have been a good move if I can play like H6 and then after that attack this. That would, would, would have been very good. But knight D5 was the was the problem. Takes, takes, and then this is also weak. Yes? Um, G5. Very good, very good Ashish. Yeah, you actually just have to take the pawn. You know, this was like semi-bluff. The point is, if I do this, I make my knight relevant. My knight is actually becoming a very good defensive piece. It goes from like, it becomes, it be, you see that piece on G7, in this position, it's like a stupid piece. But after h5, this piece suddenly becomes relevant. Now it has a very important role. It kind of keeps my uh, king's side intact, right? And it prevents white from really breaking through. And in the meantime, I have ideas like queen f6, queen h6, and maybe at some point throwing in h4 if he ever moves the knight. And then, you know, I have, you know, actually I'm, a, I'm better in this position because my opponent can't really do much in this position. He's kind of, his attack is kind of running out of steam, you know, and I'm just, you know, very, very comfortable in this position. So was his h5 actually a mistake then, you think? Uh, I mean, it was, I think, I don't know. I mean, well, he doesn't have that much if he doesn't play h5 anyway, so it was like kind of a semi-bluff, which worked. It was a practical choice. 
you know, maybe it's, it's a, like a towel move. You know, he's like an initiative player, so sometimes, you know, initiative players go for something a little risky, you know, and they take chances. I think mathematically maybe it is, but it's fine. Even knight takes h5 would have been okay. But instead I played a very bad move, knight d4. And why is this move bad? Well, because I've played this beautiful plan, doubling the rooks, and now my selfish knight goes right into d4, blocking in both the rooks, so the selfish knight wants that square all to himself, and now both of my rooks becomes completely stupid, and now white's initiative just, you know, takes a second gear because of that. So again, it was one of these games where I did not think about pieces in the way I should be in my games. So I played rook c7, and now he took, took a knight h3, and suddenly he has very big initiative. And unfortunately here, my, my position is still not so terrible, but I just collapsed here. I played here, then I played there, then I played back. So this whole knight h5 was not good, I should have at least played knight e8, and then tried to do this. But yeah, here I just collapsed. So why, he, why can't he take the pawn, the knight right away with the pawn? Right there? Well, I take back, I guess. Well, I mean, it's not like he can't, but I mean, I was, I was very happy to get rid of that knight on e5. Okay. Just, yeah. yeah, so I think this is much stronger. F4, bringing my knight to oblivion, and then knight g5, knight e8. And now, king, here comes the king, and then the rook. And uh, queen g7, rook h1. Knight f6. Yeah, here, good or bad, I should have done this. And I should have sacrificed the... I think I should have done it like this or something and sacrificed the queen. I mean, I'm probably losing, but this is completely hopeless. This is just like a very passive position where I have... where I completely tied down and I just lose. He just simply doubles now. He attacks my knight. Okay, now he can win in many different ways. He chose this one. And here I resigned. So, as you could see, you know, four games, you know, all kind of a similar theme, right? Where just not paying enough attention to piece activity. Whether it's my own pieces, my own piece coordination, you know, or sometimes it could just be one piece. Sometimes it could be a matter of giving my opponent's pieces too much relevance, just not paying attention to enough to the idea of relative piece activity. And that's why, you know, all of these losses happen. Similar theme. So make sure you guys, you know, try to not make the same kind of mistakes. And uh, hopefully you guys can learn from these games. And uh, until next time, this is Grandmaster Alexander Lenderman.